Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. We're going to get started in about uh, 12, 13 minutes now. We have a great uh, set of guests today, Ryan and Andrew, coming from the TAC team, a DoD team that's empowering over 350,000 world fighters uh, with technology. So stay tuned. It's going to be very interesting to see how the team was able to deliver value to the wall fighter and move at a pace of relevance. So uh, we're going to be starting in about uh, 12 minutes. Good afternoon, good morning everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. We're going to get started in about uh, eight minutes. We have uh, two great guests today with uh, Ryan and Andrew talking about attack and how they've been empowering the Wolf Fighter 
and move at a pace relevant with uh, software capabilities using DevSecOps. So stay tuned. It's going to be a very interesting discussion. Uh, if you've not subscribed to the Nick of Time yet, do that uh, at the, in the Nick of Time TV to get notifications about the next uh, uh, videos and live events. Um, you'll see also we are launching a metaverse and we're going to be looking for uh, 20 ambassadors. We have uh, probably already uh, 12 or 13. So uh, if you're interested, uh, make sure to reach out to us on LinkedIn. We'll talk about this today on the show. Stay tuned for another uh, seven minutes. Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of Any Cup Time. We're going to get started about uh, five minutes now with two amazing guests uh, coming from the tech team, Ryan and Andrew. We're going to be talking about how they are able to move at a pace of relevance uh, and bring software innovations to to the Warfighter. So stay tuned. Uh, another five minutes. Uh, in the meantime, if you've missed uh, some of our recent uh, videos, check out this uh, Uber hack. Uh, what we know and lessons learned that we published literally uh, four days after the breach with insights uh, coming directly from the hacker. So stay tuned. We're going to get started about uh, five minutes.
Good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks so much for joining this next episode of In the Nick of Time. Uh, we have some amazing guests today with Ryan and Andrew coming uh, from the tag team to tell us a little bit about how their team has been able to innovate and bring tremendous value to the Warfighter uh, for years now when it comes to their product and their ability to deliver uh, capabilities that is used by uh, hundreds of thousands of uh, uh, Warfighter across uh, pretty much the entire landscape of uh, uh, theaters. So this is going to be a very interesting conversation to try to see what is the recipe for success. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to remind you a couple of things. Of course, um, if you've not checked out some of the videos we published every week, uh, do that at, in the learnwithnick.com. Uh, we have uh, uh, obviously a, a free trial, but also 50% uh, off for civilian, military, and, and even veterans. And of course, 20% off for everybody else with a coupon code Less Beat China. Uh, so check that out. Um, if you missed it, we have uh, pushed a Uber hack, uh, what we know and lessons learned video a few days after the hack with insights coming directly from the hacker and really kind of diving into the ability of the malicious actor to laterally move to the crown jewel and how they've done that which kind of uh, pushed us to uh, do another uh, video after that and deep dive on the glass accounts uh, which effectively is how the the malicious actor uh, managed to uh, escalate privilege and get to the crown jewel uh, so we we did a video because we couldn't really find anything online really uh, doing a good job at describing both uh, what all the break glass accounts how to use it uh, right and how to protect them uh, as well so check that out if you missed it uh, both of these videos are completely free on the on the channel uh, we also thanks to you and more than ninety thousand uh views and uh 250 comments released the top uh, 20 books of 2022 uh if you've not uh, checked the list uh, you need to do that there's a couple of books that are uh, essential to your uh, growth, uh, personal growth, but also uh, if you have missed uh, more recently, uh, the book called The War With Our Rules from Charles Paulding is doing a very uh, good job at showing why uh, the United States is already at war with China. Uh, it's, it's just a great book that really summarizes very well 
uh, what China has been doing for 20 plus years uh, to uh, infiltrate uh, both uh, our education system companies and uh, effectively uh, get a, a tremendous set of uh, uh, key uh, capabilities and technology innovations to uh, compete and fight back and take the lead uh, in 2050 uh, compared to, to the United States. So this is a, a great book to, to check out. Last thing before we get started, wanted to remind everybody we're going to be launching next month uh, a pretty unique uh, new capability. Um, it's going to be completely free, um, so you're going to need to check that out, but it's going to be uh, uh, effectively a, a metaverse uh, on laptops, you know, mobile cloud native uh, town, we call it, which will be the first uh, world's uh, uh, first cloud native metaverse community. We're going to have uh, effectively CNCF companies on there, a lot of training videos, releases about new uh, new products, new capabilities. Uh, you're going to be able to go and join keynotes and listen to uh, uh, speakers. Uh, you're going to have you know fun games, effectively dedicated rooms to have discussions about things like Kubernetes and Service Mesh and uh, you know, uh, cyber and, and so on. So it's going to be uh, pretty exciting to see, you know, with the, the subscribers and none with Nick, uh, thousands of people will be able to come and uh, chat, engage and have access to our content. Of course, all the videos will be there so you can walk around and get to see different content. So it's going to be fun. So we're looking for ambassador to help us kind of uh, uh, make sure that uh, no one is doing stupid stuff in there. Uh, so we're going to probably get uh, 20. We have about 13 now. So we need seven more uh, ambassador uh, so if you're interested, reach out to me on LinkedIn. Uh, also, we are, we have a lot of CNCF companies already giving us their content videos and um, information to push their content on the metaverse. But if you know companies that would be interested to uh, uh, push their stuff on the platform, uh, reach out to us as well. All right. So now I wanted to, uh, of course, uh, introduce the, the tag team. We have two amazing uh, guests today. Um, so that's going to be fun. Uh, Ryan and Andrew. So Ryan is uh, the director of the TAC Product Center. Um, as a director, he leads the team of expert technologists and is empowering uh, 3,000 developers and 350,000 military civilians and uh, international users. Uh, the baseline, the technical baseline, uh, effectively uh, is, is empowered by TAC for 18 U.S. government uh, program of record. Uh, that enables uh, multiple active uh, foreign military cells uh, cases. It's a key component of every uh, combat theater. Uh, he has a computer degree, computer engineer <laughs> by degree, and he's a is a CISUN executive and loves delighting users. Uh, who doesn't? Andrew is a site reliability engineer, and and for people that don't know, uh, maybe what, what a site reliability engineer is. Uh, check out that video. We do uh, a pretty good job at uh, kind of giving a, a quick rundown of uh, SREs came from Google. Um, and so if you don't know what that job uh, entails, uh, uh, that's probably the, the future of operation teams. So uh, check it out. SREs are a key piece of your DevSecOps teams. So Andrew is a SRE at uh, the, the TAC Product Center. And uh, since 2019, he has been the leading uh, he has been leading the architecture and implementation uh, of the TAC developer platform, uh, empowering those engineers to ship world-class software in a continuous, cons consistent, reliable, and secure manner. Before joining TAC, um, he engineered cutting-edge uh, first-to-market projects for distributed analytics at uh, leading technology and research organizations. Uh, in his spare time, he maintains packages for Arc Linux and enjoys uh, going on hikes. Uh, so he's uh, multifaceted, uh, just like Ryan. So it's going to be fun to have them. We're going to bring them on the screen now um, and welcome them. Ryan, Andrew, welcome on the show. Pleasure. Excited hey. to be here. Yeah. Yeah. We're, we're very, very lucky to have you. Um, you know, you, you guys are actually bringing tremendous value, uh, tangible value, right? A lot of people have pretty amazing numbers. I was uh, very good at uh, bloating my own uh, achievements in DoD. And, but you guys are doing the opposite. You're, you're over delivering and, and bringing tremendous value uh, to teams uh, across the government and uh, many 5i partners and other uh, federal agencies. So it's going to be interesting to do a deep dive with you 
on the how, because, you know, people argue that what you're doing is impossible in the U.S. government, and yet uh, you've proved them wrong. And so that's going to be an interesting uh, discussion. First, uh, before we get started, I always ask the same question uh, of everybody. So we're going to start with uh, Ryan, and then we'll go to Andrew. But uh, tell us a little bit about your journey. Sure. I have ended up in the TAC uh, ecosystem by accident twice now. Uh, I showed up at uh, Air Force Research Laboratory back in 2013 uh, as a punk second lieutenant. I showed up. They said, what do you do? And I said, well, I can code. Uh, and they said, well, we have this new thing called ATAC, and we just need a, another developer on it. So have you done Android? No. Have you done Java? Yeah, I've been doing Java since high school. Uh, so they said, great. That'll work. Go learn Android uh, and we'll do some stuff. And so did some stuff, um, took a bit of a detour that has been really, uh, really foundational for me. So I uh, was selected to be a, a kind of a detachment commander liaison officer as a first lieutenant uh, for this program, this experimental UAS program from AFRL. So went over to Afghanistan, led that for six months. Um, and that was my first real exposure to SOCOM. So up until that point for me, like SOCOM was this kind of mystical entity um, and, you know, a lot of secrecy around it for good reason. But um, as a command, I got to start to understand, like from being there on the forward operating base, how the command operates, how it how it uh, runs operations. And then also spent, um, you know, just as a person, like six months, six months embedded with an airborne infantry uh, battalion. So. Um, that was that was really unique because by the end of that, I had seen some of the technology gaps. I had come from the ATAC branch. ATAC was not a program of record anywhere. Um, and the UIS we were flying over there had had seen some systems integration improvements as well with mesh networking radios. Uh, so came back, was able to deliver pretty quickly some new capabilities for that UIS with pushing electronic warfare information from the aircraft overhead down to the notional ATAC user on the ground over a, a, a wave relay radio. Uh, that's kind of what I got it. Like before that, I didn't get it. And then, you know, like that that stuff came together technically, um, you know, in terms of the user being out with them. And at that point, like I could say, I kind of got it. Uh, so I spent a lot of time with that community with UIS, developing plugins for ATAC. And then um, I also spent quite a bit of time knowing the fires community. So I, I, I think it was the first acquisitions person to go through the JTAC qualification course, um, and and that again was foundational because I, I actually started you know getting like um, uh, like controls um, you know directed strikes to to you know kind of under my belt. Um, if you were to come over the uh, over me on on you know an aircraft on the radio, I I would tell you I am not a JTAC, but I can be helpful because um, it's actually required by doctrine. Um, and so yeah, I spent some time in industry doing. Um, more tax stuff. I uh, didn't really expect to, but it kind of worked out that way. Uh, spent time back on orders. Um, so I'm still a, a, in the reserves. I'm a major in the Air Force Reserve uh, doing software and flight tests, kind of where those two come together. Uh, and this is pretty cool projects right now with the A-10 and the F-15C. So two two platforms that aren't particularly popular with uh, the Air Force um, were able to move quickly in some respects. So that's pretty cool. Um, ended up back on the federal side about, uh, I don't know, a little over a year ago. Uh, I knew I wanted to come back on the federal side. Uh, would like to get a PhD at some point and, and uh, you know, being a federal civilian is a good opportunity to do that. Um, and again, the second time, uh, just by accident, ended up back in uh, the, the TAC world. So when I started doing TAC, it was not a product center. Like there was just people doing things at the research lab over time, uh, would transition into multiple programs of record. Uh, so by the time I came back to federal government last year, uh, there was a change in leadership and I just happened to be literally right place, right time, right person and uh, have found myself leading this incredible uh, and lean team at the TAC Product Center. So we're a U.S. government organization um, where I, we're all, all of us are steeped in our craft. Uh, whether that's like kind of organizational leadership, TAC development, TAC users, or, uh, or, or like site reliability engineering with Andrew um, for military sales cases. There's a, definitely a deep expertise required to execute those uh, from the government side or, uh, or just finance. Like we have to be really good at finance because we, we manage our own finances. We have to be really good at cybersecurity because we steward TAC.gov ourselves. Like there's no backstop. Um, we, we implement cutting edge practices, technologies to do that. Um, but we're very much an empowered organization that's kind of one degree removed 
from the palm. Um, and as I'm sure we'll get into, there, there's, there's good and uh, not so good aspects to that, but we tend to focus on the good and then operate with our means. So um, yeah, we, uh, we, we exist to empower the tech user, whether that's a developer, uh, an operator, uh, it kind of fits with where my personal career has gone too. is like, you know, building software organizations, achieve flow within this really complex, tightly regulated space of the DOD. Uh, and, and here we are. Um, we'll get more to tech products and kind of how we do what we do, but that's how I got to where I am. Yeah, that's that's so exciting. And, you know, we're lucky we have people like you in the, in the reserve to be able to, uh, you know, do what you do. So uh, let's bring now Andrew, uh, and I'm going to move him up for him to be able to tell him a little bit about uh, his journey too. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate that, Nick. Yeah, so really I joined the team in 2019, uh, right when the Tech Product Center was uh, being established and uh, basically was tasked with um, migrating uh, the existing services that developers were using from a, uh, a contracting company to um, our own GovCloud space and uh, orchestrating that and then uh, really growing it from there uh, so we can continue to, um, could continue to, uh, you know, support our growth uh, and the trajectory with that. Um, but yeah, it's really been uh, a lot of automation uh, is what I would say, automating the things that need to be automated uh, so that we can continue to, to not be bogged down in toil, for example, um, understanding uh, you know, where it makes sense for things to be self-service versus uh, a little bit more hands-on uh, from the tech products on our staff side. Um, but yeah, it's it's been uh, it's been interesting uh, and exciting, and I'm glad to be here. Yeah, you know, I wish more people in DoD would understand what toil even means, right? So I did a video about it, right? So that's what I do when I find that people don't know much about a concept. I say, hey, you know, let's do a video. So for people that don't know what toil and how to manage your toll uh, toll budget and uh, take down that that toil and automate and ruthless automation, right, is kind of the uh, the vision there um and so yeah for people should check that out right um uh, i think it's a tremendous piece of the puzzle of uh of site reliability engineers and so um we have the chance to have uh, both of you here today because you know you, you're bringing kind of um, two different backgrounds right um it's actually pretty interesting to see uh the two profiles um and the kind of difference in skills that you bring to the table so ryan can you tell us a little bit about the <laughs> The tech founding story. I know that's uh, uh, that's a very um, when you describe it to me, I I, I was like, we're you know, it's like a movie uh, in real life. So it's it's always <laughs> it's always fun. Oh boy, yeah, it's uh, it's it's been quite the journey to get to where we are now. Uh, today, tech funding is probably as consistent as it's been, which is which is still not saying much. So let's rewind. Um, starting in like. 2008 2009 it was effectively a, a lab program uh, we knew there were some problems to be solved with digitally aided close air support and so uh, AFRL with help from a, a few other um, organizations started to get together this vision of using smartphones which were then an emerging technology uh, start to um, get maps on phones uh, and see just what we could do with that so for the first several years um, of tax existence, it was um, it, it was just um, like pure six one six two type funding. Um, the right people in SOCOM saw tell the people product. what that tell people what six two six one. Most people don't oh, know. Thanks. Yeah. I know, but you, you need to give a little insight on what that means. <laughs> yeah, pure research and development. So in the DoD, we put a lot of effort into trying to get programs to uh, kind of a programmer record or sustained status. And so there is some analog to like the book Loon Shots, where you know the one of the recommendations is separate the the the, the kind of the really moonshotty R and D stuff from the stuff that tends to move a bit slower. So that's that's kind of where ATEX started in that pure, fast moving, pivot a lot, find your way R and D realm. Um, but now it's it's very much moved into that sustained realm. So uh, that transition started to occur, that phase change from total like R&D world to more sustained started to happen in probably the 2012, 2013, 2014 timeframe where some programs of record began to adopt TAC. Um, but really 
all along, tech has been um, a very well used stream of small dollars. So, you know, we look at programs uh, like outside tech that, you know, it's like, we'll sol solve these big problems that need to be solved for the DOD or other agencies in the, you know, the billion dollar range, um, you know, 30 million annual spend, $100 million annual spend, $2 billion annual spend for a huge portfolio. Um, and by all means, those, you know, those dollar figures need to be there, those magnitudes need to be there, but tech has always been really nimble. So for the, I'd say when it was at uh, AFRL, um, you know, the annual budget was no more than a, than a couple million dollars, you know, so you're talking um, a few, you know, three, three to eight, maybe full-time employees developing TAC. Um, and so the key there was we would always get people on site with the users. So um, tended to be with kind of the national mission force community in SOCOM initially, and we would get people out to like jump ranges. So that was one of the first um, non-fires applications of TAC was, hey, could I use this thing uh, kind of like what you see here behind me? Like, could I use that device to be my like kind of like a cockpit display as I'm jumping down from an aircraft under a canopy with a parachute, military free fall. Can I navigate with that? And we found out, yeah, we can do that. Um, and so in many cases, the jumper would land kit and all, you know, everything on them, camo, helmet, all the gear. And they'd walk over to the developer parachute still like streaming on the ground behind them. They walk over to the developer, say, this sucked. Can you make this better? Um, and that's probably like kind language compared to what we hear out there. So that's where we started in a very crude, rudimentary form of DevOps. Um, there were no pipelines. There was no CI. There was no unit testing. There was certainly no tech.gov. There were things like it, but not really a government owned platform back then. Um, and, and so at, you know, a few million dollars a year, now we've grown to a place where the tech product center is well-resourced, well-endowed uh, by what we call our TAC configuration steering board. And that's a collection of uh, PEO, uh, program executive office. So um, kind of senior middle management in the DOD offices that all agree every year, hey, we're going to chip in an equal slice of the pie and we're gonna make TAC viable. Um, and so that's that's what funds our organization. There's also revenue from foreign military sales cases. So go from back then to where it was, you know, a few, a few million here, a few million there, maybe some fallout, um, plus some plug-in development from, from like, especially the soft communities, special operations forces communities, to now we have, you know, fairly uh, well-resourced program offices um, like PEO C3T on the Army side and, and PEO Soldier to senior mission, senior material leader, um, airspace, mission, airspace mission planning and Aeronet on the Air Force side, special warfare on the Air Force side, several program offices in SOCOM, and then also federal agencies like Department of State, Department of Justice. Um, and we've had a very warm relationship with DHS as well over the years. So um, it's all these people that come together and say, look, um, we care about friendly force identification and target correlation, whether that's um, a, a target to be prosecuted with kinetic, kinetic effects, whether that's um, an adversary that just needs to be kind of rolled up and captured, or whether that's just me getting from point A to point B. Um, People care about doing that. And what we've been able to strike is this really nice balance of commoditized product, which we ship with this budget, and then also a highly extensible plugins model. So Andrew alluded to automation. Um, automation and modularity happen throughout the TAC community. Um, and so with a you know a fairly modest budget of about nine and a half million dollars a year, we're able to steward these capabilities for a, a large and growing ecosystem. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's pretty amazing, and we'll we'll do a deep dive on, also on the, the the mobile stuff. I, as you can yeah. see on the on the banner at the bottom, people can go and create an account and yeah. check on the Google Play Store, the ATAC app, and the ITAC app on the Apple Store. Um, we'll we'll talk a little bit about accreditation at some point and how yeah. you go through this uh, challenge of uh, mobile apps. I, I think mobile apps are probably the the hardest. Uh, things to get uh, credited uh, on the in the department, so that's going to be interesting. So, yes, you, know, you talked about uh, obviously the the funding story. Um, you you talk about funding, but uh, how big is TAC today when it comes to people? Mm -hmm. 
It's uh, it's like a multi-layered answer. Um, we can't measure daily active users the same way that like Facebook or another large connected platform would. Uh, many of our users are very sparingly on the grid, especially if they're using these uh, commercial devices in a classified environment running ATAC, they're never going to pop up online and say, I've been using TAC this much. Um, so, so the layers are something like this. So we made TAC.gov. Uh, anybody can go there and get an account. The permissions are really well architected to where if, if you're only a public website user, you only have a Gmail address, you're not on contract to the government, um, you can get public website access. Um, all the way up to military SDK access, which is the full suite of Title X capabilities, military capabilities with a need to know. So on TAC.gov, we have, I think, about 17,000 registered TAC users. And then we also have um, north of 3,000 registered developers. So, so right there, we'll call that about 17,000. And that's one bucket that overlaps with several others. Um, we have, I think, north of, of 170,000 um, uh, ATAC users now. So those are distinct downloads tied to individual uh, Google accounts through Google Play Store. Um, and, uh, and we have some controls, some restrictions in place, make sure that we're not willingly giving capability to embargoed countries. Uh, but but by and large, it's it's pretty much open to uh, to, to the most of the world. Uh, it's about 170,000 users there. Um, ITAC, uh, I believe, is, is north of 70,000 users just through uh, Apple App Store today. Um, so you know, those overlap to some degree. It's really hard for us to tell which ones are distinct. So we'll just call that about two, 200,000 users outright um, through commercial channels. Um, then we also have the government program of record space. So we know there are some fairly large um, user bases that are only growing in like, especially like conventional army infantry where, where you know, TAC is really taking off among airborne, but also other uh, echelon or other types of formations. There's the soft formations. There's there's now a growing caucus in the uh, the air crew community, uh, Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps, um, and then there's the mounted community as well. Whether that's on you know vehicles on the ground or, or helicopters. And so best we can tell just by talking to program offices and the number of physical kits they've fielded that have ATAC or or, or WinTAC or whatever client app running on them. That's that's about another hundred and fifty thousand. So. Um, Based on as, as 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 I think deep as we can track without truly knowing daily active users, there's about 350,000 users across the, the commercial public space and the military space. And the trend that we've observed is, uh, as we have tracked numbers over the years, it it, it, it tends to be an exponential growth curve. Um, so you hear Andrew hit on automation. I've talked about automation. The only way the developer community and the user community can grow is through automation, robust plugin APIs, uh, freely available SDKs, freely available product. Um, and that's that's a big reason why why we're at the, the volume we are today. And when you look at the, the, the team uh, internal to the, the tech team, what are we talking mm -hmm. about in terms of what it takes to support and build all these capabilities? Yeah, we're at about 20 to 24 people, depending on kind of where we are in the year. Yeah, it's a, it's a very lean crew. Um, everybody's expected to kind of be at the varsity level in their craft, um, and, and we get a lot of stuff done. Uh, you know, we're, we we operate as a pretty tight team. You know, we, we're on daily standup every day as a staff, just because there's so much happening. There's there's no way we could just do with a once a week staff meeting or something like that. So we treat it as a standup. We go around just like we would on a scrum team, um, and that was a tactic that I picked up on on another team. Even at the program level, it is so helpful. Uh, to have that kind of a cadence, but yeah, it's it's a small team. Downstream, we have programs off program offices that have you know 20, 40, 100 people um, supporting the configuration management of these kits, plugin development. But at the TAC product center, kind of where all the source code lives on TAC.gov and proliferates out, we're about 20, two dozen people. Yeah, that's pretty amazing. Uh, very lean and, and effective, and I guess multifaceted kind of full stack, yeah. you know, model. Um, so when you when you look at your release cycle, what are we talking about in terms of of velocity of release? Yeah, we we feel it like our biggest commitment to the community beyond like a, a really good usable product is just a predictable release cadence. 
Um, so we release currently on a trimesterly basis. Um, I mean, frankly, like internally, like if we're testing um, or, or we're like, you know, running our own operations, like at a you know field event or something like that, um, you know, we do see like truly elite Dora metric performance, but there's a lot of downstream dependencies at these program offices that we serve where, you know, just getting an ATO for a new major version, you know, 4.x, 5.x, et cetera, uh, that's a six month lead time. And there's configuration management. Some program offices have really long lead times for DT, developmental test, operational test, getting kits out with devices on them. Um, ATAC in particular has really forced uh, the DOD program office space to evolve in ways, hey, users say they want this, so, you can either tell the user, no, you don't get this, which program offices have done, or you can say, here, you get this, in which case most program offices kind of end up back on that path anyway of having to evolve their practices, their configuration management, learning how to get Android devices or whatever fielded. Um, so it's a, every 120 days for us, um, just to align to some other larger DOD programs, we're trying to drive that in the next uh, six to 12 months to like a quarterly release cadence. But um, by and large, you know, we we make um, our, our our regular builds available um, through tech.gov or, or through at least our, our canary channels on a on a daily basis. Um, just depends on how uh, how quickly um, programs or people want to accept. You know, kind of want to make that decision that business decision of release versus deploy. We make the releases available for test uh, as frequently as people want them, but deploy typically happens on a, you know, a, a four to six month basis or, or, or less frequently, which we're also trying to help program offices overcome. So, so each, each program office effectively has uh, their own cycle or they try to yeah. align to the same versions. Yeah, they'll, they'll have their own cycle. Um, so some program offices uh, will be on the latest minor version. So we use a semantic versioning scheme of, uh, of major version, minor version, uh, patch release. Uh, if you look on Google Play Store, I think we're on 4.7.0.4. Um, and so 4.7 is kind of the current um, baseline uh, version of tech products that's out right now. But honestly, Nick, we'll find programs in the DoD that for whatever reason um, are handicapped from, from releasing more frequently. Sometimes it's for really valid reasons. There's some big like DOD level things where like you can't release a fires configuration, you know, if we're doing air to ground fires or surface to surface fires, doing that digitally, unless it's really thoroughly validated. And that's a process that, you know, we can do a little bit to help solve at Pack Product Center, but but it's it's some pretty big, you know, joint uh, requirements level uh, rocks that we've got to solve for. Um, programs will typically be like one to two minor versions behind where we are again there's a few bleeding edge organizations that always stay up on latest yeah. um but i think you know if you were to pull the community you'd probably find um a lot of organizations on 4.4 and a lot of organizations on 4.2 um we're really trying to help downstream program offices overcome those barriers to, to configuration management and accreditation because we take a really i think robust approach to cybersecurity. so we're we're we invest like 10 to 15 percent of our budget annually in in the tooling, um, the, the processes, the uh, kind of like third party assessments, red teams, blue teams of our products to make sure that like the latest version of TAC is always the most secure. It doesn't just have the best features, but it's also the most secure. Um, and so like that's the biggest reason for being up on latest that I think we see is like features may be better, but features are manifesting more and more in the plugin space. New features come with plugins. Our role is to make sure that the products that we ship, the core products on which the plugins ride, are stable and they're secure. Um, and that's the biggest benefit of staying up on on latest. So when, when you look at the, the plugin landscape, uh, how mm -hmm. many of the plugins are, are built by by the tag team internally versus owners and third parties? Yeah, we, we deliver, we develop and sustain hardly any plugins. Um, I think there's maybe one or two that we truly uh, have developed for for TAC, but our our role is is the core products themselves. I think there, I think we did a a, a query just last week, and we're, we're at about 250 plugins now. 
that doesn't mean they're all like fully baked, like ready for prime time plugins. People use the plugin space like as it should be used for like R and D purposes. People also use plugins for for like very serious real world things like Link 16 and Saddle and VMF like data link interoperability. Some pretty stringent requirements. So plugins uh, run the spectrum of 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 you know very alpha you know pre beta feel to highly mature you know really polished sustained things. But we did you we have, a, sure have a marketplace? Mm -hmm. I guess do you have uh, yeah, a marketplace so tech... for the plugins or how do people find them? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, if you go to tech.gov um, and and look at our, our products tab, um, you'll find all releasable plugins for your permission level available there. You do have to log in to, to download them. Uh, we do have uh, several plugins approved for public release and in uh, the Google Play Store as well, at least for ATAC. Do you have a, a validation process for plugins or just anyone can go and post it or you you do some sort of assessment, cyber assessment? How do you how do you vet plugins, I guess? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, plugins are generally handled as as like bespoke to specific programs. So before somebody uh, gets to the point where they want to, so let's say somebody come, let's say a program comes to Tech Product Center says, I want to develop a new plugin. We say, great, we've got the tools in place to do that. Um, so we'll help them uh, with, you know, automation being key. We'll help them get a new project created in GitLab. They'll they'll clone like the Hello World project, which is also available on GitHub. Um, and, and, and they'll download the ATAC SDK. So, um, you know, they don't get the full soup to nuts source code if they don't need it. Um, instead, they'll just have access to the, the plugin API and the document documentation around it. The, the government representative for that plugin, or if it's a private company developing it, the, the person paying for that plugin at the company um, will fill out um, an, a memorandum for record for us. We've got a, an MFR template that says, hey, how and when and, and to what type of audience do you want your plugin released? Um, that today is still a little bit of paperwork, requires a digital signature, but we're working to automate that on tech.gov. And that tells us assign these permissions in tech.gov to this plugin uh, and on, on GitLab to this plugin. So when that plugin is ready for like a beta release or like, a, you know, it's been, if it needs to go through like a, a robust, like developmental test, operational test cycle, whatever that program manager decides for that plugin based on the process they have at their organization, we just help them follow that with the plugin release process. So the plugins you see on Google Play Store, for example, like Data Sync, Vehicle Navigation System, uh, and a couple others, those have all uh, th those all have uh, a little bit of paperwork, a little bit of paper trail behind them, where a program manager on the government side or an industry has said, "I want this plugin released to Play Store and my if it's a government plugin, government owned plugin, um, I want my foreign disclosure officer to sign off as well and say this this is approved for public release. Um, so there's actually quite a bit of rigor that goes into not just releasing the core products themselves, like we see it on Play Store, GitHub, there's a lot of paperwork that went into that because you know, we're the government and we're good at paperwork, but we're, we also make sure that, like the requisite rigor is there um, for, for um, kind of the, the less glamorous aspects of software development in the government, like foreign uh, release, foreign disclosure, um, uh, public affairs, uh, legal aspects, and um, and then security as well. So we run Fortify scans, um, you know, kind of the standard batch of Fortify scans across all the um, the, the, the uh, Android space, uh, the Windows space, the, I think the tax server space, and I think just about all of our products get the, the full suite of, um, um, of Fortify scans. That's an artifact that we provide downstream to program offices in an effort to help them with their own accreditation process. Yeah, so you give them the the scan results of the scanners, mm -hmm. and so they can directly see the uh, the results without having to do their own scans. And and so I guess um, plugins usually are all native to to the to the to the phone technology, or or is it designed to be agnostic to the platform? I guess. Good question. Yeah. So right now, plugins are platform specific. Um, in other words, ATAC plugins will only work in ATAC, WinTAC plugins right. only run in WinTAC, uh, TAC server, WebTAC, et cetera. Um, there, were some, there were some fundamental limitations, um, like I'll say like seven or eight years ago when we first started investing at AFRL in a plugin architecture um, that, that caused us to go down a path that uh, led to a, a different architecture for ATAC, a different architecture for WinTAC, different architecture for TAC server. Um, you know, we, we've tried, you know, tools like like Xamarin, uh, for example, you know, a few years ago, we said, hey, could we just have ATAC that also runs on Windows? Well, 
based on some very fundamental constraints of the map engine, the globe itself, which is really high quality, we had to make a design choice to have kind of a, a globe and, and comms, you know, communications kernel backend that is portable between Windows and Android. Um, and then kind of a wrapper for like the plugin APIs, the uh, the UI and stuff like that, that is different for, for like Android, Windows, um, iPhone, et cetera. And what, what map technology do you guys use? It's custom. Um, so uh, we started off in the early days using a derivative of NASA WorldWind, so heavily um, modified from that baseline. But uh, since we've, we, so our, our lead developer, Chris Lawrence, he's actually a geospatial and computer graphics expert as well. Um, and, and so we've been able to take that map engine, what we call TAC kernel, which has the comms layer, the map engine, et cetera, all wrapped into it. Um, and, and take that through the NGA, uh, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency validation process. And this is really unique, Nick, because uh, this, this is the first, I think the first app to do this in, in the Android space, at least, be, be certified by the, by the NGA uh, for target coordinate mensuration. Now, that's a really specific capability for the fires, like air to ground fires, surface surface fires realm in the DOD. But the map engine and ATAC provided the map imagery is also of a certain quality is is good enough and is validated uh, to, to actually put a, a GPS guided bomb down on a coordinate derived from the, the Android map. Yeah. Wow. That's that the precision required for that obviously is <laughs> it's quite important and you can mess up. And that's that's a very specific expertise. Um, and I guess, are you enabling teams to have different overlay of maps or different uh, abilities yes. to to layer stuff? Yeah, yeah. So we, we try to support uh, every uh, map imagery type imaginable. Um, there are a couple gaps that we know about, but um, by and large, we serve the broad community. So native imagery that you would get um, from a, you know, a national intelligence platform uh, all the way to just, you know, basic WMS, WMTS sources from, you know, if you want to pull down like Google or Bing imagery, um, really super easy ways to, to put those uh, endpoints in as URLs in the layers tool and start streaming map imagery. Uh, that was a really big deal uh, eight, eight, nine years ago. Uh, we used some yeah. open source technology called the MOBAC tool, uh, host tiles in the map engine. And now you can actually just be on your phone and stream that map imagery. That, like, that didn't exist in the DoD. Um, so it does now uh, the platforms as well, but uh, that was kind of a first. But um, yeah, th things like um, 3D models as well, those are well supported in, uh, in ATAC and WinTAC. Um, and, um, and then like KMZ, KML overlays, so like shape files, most of the standard stuff you would expect to like throw on a map in, in any other tool, Google Earth or otherwise, uh, you can reasonably expect to see represented well in, in the TAC products. That's very cool. So a couple of questions on your on your funding. We're going to get into that. Yeah. But uh, um, really, you know, when I when I take a step back and I look mm -hmm. at uh, what questions people ask me when they see innovative teams like you guys mm -hmm. is, you know, how do we sustain them? How do we make sure they're going to exist? you know, two or three years from now. And a lot of people argue that you have to be a, a program of record to to do that. And I, I've seen when people do it, including at Platform One, and we mm -hmm. made them a, a program of record. I think uh, uh, often it's a beginning of the end of, of the agility aspect of things. Yes. And so it's a big problem. Uh, I would argue that you probably don't want to be a program of record. But tell us a little bit about how you're funded. Yeah, absolutely. Um... The configuration steering board that I mentioned, um, I mean, the, the long and the short of it is they send a, a MIPR or military interdepartmental purchase request uh, every year uh, at some point in the year to uh, our finance people. Uh, and we get that routed to our various contract vehicles or our civilian staff uh, positions. Um, but we're we're unique, uh, maybe not totally unique, but you know, somewhat unique in that um, TAC, as broadly used as it is, is actually um, a layer completely removed from the kind of the congressional um, PPBNE or planning, programming, budgeting, and execution cycle. 
Um, we're not a working capital fund. We're not a working capital organization. We're a product house. Um, but each of those organizations effectively serves as an investor on what you would liken to like a, a, a corporate board of investors in private sector. Um, we view ourselves as a company that, that operates with inside the U.S. government truly uh, be, because we, we do have that separation from the kind of the congressional budgeting process. Um, so funds are always tight, um, but we operate within our means. We, we, we are on a, you know, uh, a very uh, regular kind of budgeting, spin plan tracking process. Um, you know, things happen and we've got to be able to respond to those as a staff and we do. Um, but, you know, where we funded, we have a pretty good idea at the start of the fiscal year where we'll be. We kind of start working that several months in advance with our um, with our kind of upstream program office customers and then uh, where we can put labor. Um, uh, civilian labor, uh, cloud infrastructure costs, tooling costs, uh, developer labor, where we can put uh, costs toward those things, then we uh, we do that within our, our notional funding profile. Um, but it is, uh, yeah, it's not tied to uh, the, um, the legacy process, which helps and hurts. Like, we do think to ourselves sometimes like, boy, wouldn't it be great if if we didn't have a concern about X being funded? Wouldn't it be great if, you know, we, we were funded at this level? Um, and so to some degree, I think, I think tech does need, the tech product center does need to be resourced to a greater degree. You know, like I said, we're funded at nine and a half million dollars to not just like do like coding development, which would be a very healthy budget for just coding. But it, it's the full spectrum of delivery. It's it's the it's the the, 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 the kind of the overhead like staff that comes with that. Operations. Exactly. Like you know, I think DoD in general is just kind of coming to grips with um, how powerful cloud can be, but but also like you got to be able to pay the bill. Um, and like we don't see our cloud bill slowing down at Tech Products Center anytime soon. We've seen a very steady, predictable, linear increase as our user base has has like steadily grown on tech.gov i said earlier like our user base is exponential but like our user uh count on tech.gov is very linear in nature so it makes for cloud costs to be very you know predictable in nature um but you know if our funding is level um that calls into question like well then what happens like what gets prioritized if if your top line is level and your operating costs are going like this you got to make some hard decisions so that's why we say like we know what like tech product centers should be priced out at on an annual basis. We think there's a lot of value in being kind of a degree removed from the palm because that gives us a lot of agility. Um, notionally, if we were a, a, um, a, a you know a formal program of record or a jointly operated program, we, we would probably end up with ACAT one oversight just due to the the breadth of the program. Um, it's not even a program, right? We just said that. Uh, but the, the breadth of the kind of the user base, the, the, the utilization of the products. Um, I think we find a lot of value in the configuration steering model, uh, configuration steering board model that we employ um, because we're always, you know, we're always pushing to deliver that that next best increment of value. Uh, but we do have to find some creative ways to um, kind of resource this huge and, and growing customer base as well. We're, we're, that's an unsolved problem. Are you impacted in any way during uh, the continuing resolution? Uh, not really. We, you know, since we operate on that um, kind of that out of hide um, fund contribution basis. Yeah, they may throw the money ahead enough yeah. to not uh, okay. impact you. There, yeah. I mean, there, there are impacts there. Like, so different CSB members will, will send their funding at different points in the year. Um, and yeah. so, you know, if, if they're counting on... Money, yeah, so like we have some that like count on sending their funds toward the end of the fiscal year, um, right. once once the rest of their accounts are settled, and you know it then you can get on it how long it lasts. Too, I assume. If yeah, it lasts exactly. Forever, yeah. So, so yeah. Congress has to wake up and do their jobs, but that's a different problem. <laughs> yeah, different problem exactly. But yeah, we you know I think on average we we process about um, you know one of those purchase requests every month, um, mm -hmm. and and it works. But if you look at, you know, the different channels where we put funding, whether on, uh, you know, a couple different contracts, because uh, it's mm -hmm. important that we break out our, our developers from our kind of behind the, behind the green curtain, um, 
you know, systems engineering, technical advisors, staff, our CETA staff. Those are the people that, you know, we have to empower, like, like Andrew, for example. Um, you know, we need to empower those people to operate largely in the same way we do on the government side, whereas um, it's, it's not important for, like, our developers to have that same level of kind of oversight and, and access. Um, you know, but anyway, that drives multiple contracting vehicles and we have to kind of split things up. Uh, we have yep. to, you know, make very deliberate choices about where we put that very like, hyper incremental funding. Um, we plan for it. We, we, we feel like we have a good plan in place all the time. Uh, we're ready to execute to that and make changes, but, but it does make for, a, uh, what can be a pretty precarious situation. You know, it's not truly one funding increment every month. It's more like, you know, a few funding increments this month. And then a few months later, a few more, it's, it's chunked. And, um, yeah. We do Which have is to good and bad. Sometimes. Yeah, it's good and bad. Yeah. Yeah. So tell us, uh, I guess, a little bit about, um, and I know it's kind of both you and Andrew here, uh, about your tech stack and your cloud environment, right? Because um, there is a government-provided uh, capability there. You also leverage a lot of open source and uh, uh, commercial uh, technologies. You talked about GitLab uh, for your Cisco repo stuff and uh, probably CI stuff and uh, tell us a little bit about what you got there. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, as you had mentioned, um, we do heavily leverage open source uh, software. Uh, so, for example, um, you know, for our uh, our chat, we use Mattermost, um, GitLab, GitLab Runners. Uh, are you yeah. on the GitLab side? Are you hosted on GitLab.com or you have your own instance? No, we self-host. Uh, we basically yeah. all of the services that we run are self-hosted. Yeah. Um, what cloud? Sorry. What what cloud do you use? Oh, it's, it's GovCloud. It's GovCloud. GovCloud yeah. Mm -hmm. AWS. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And uh, all five role, what what impact level I guess do you end up hosting the stuff at? Yeah, we hosted IL four yeah. on the on the Fed oh, yeah. ATO. Yeah. Yeah. Got it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, it's it's a fairly standard. You know, I would guess. Uh, you could describe it as like a cloud infrastructure configuration, reverse proxies, uh, NAT for egress, mm -hmm. your public-private subnets, uh, et cetera. Uh, got several Kubernetes clusters at this point. Um, really, uh, I would say kind of the highest, uh, well, maybe not the highest, but it definitely plays a core part in uh, all of this is the uh, the builds cluster that we've uh, we've established. Yeah, that, that's the biggest challenge, right? For mobile mobile work, that's on GovCloud. I mean, you know, there's a lot of services on the traditional Amazon services, but uh, obviously, GovCloud does not always have the the same parity. So, what do you end up using, I guess, for Android and, and iOS? Yeah, so really, um, for well, so for iOS, it's not at the same scalability uh, as, uh, for example, ATAC and really anything that um, is uh, is using that builds cluster, if you will, because really with with uh, iOS development, it, it really is uh, ITAC and then um, some compilations for TAC kernel uh, mm -hmm. in particular. Um, but the with the builds cluster in particular, that, that has uh, not only the GitLab runners, uh, the controller pods in there, but it also is leveraging a cluster autoscaler. So we might be able to do, um, so while everyone's doing their own plugin development, right? So you have kind of this uh, asynchronous uh, CI pipeline situation kind of happening. And then um, whenever there needs to be a, a complete build of ATAC core and then all the plugins, uh, we have another pipeline that gets kicked off and that pipeline, uh, as of fairly recently, I would say within the past two to three weeks now, uh, has enabled this massive, massive concurrency situation. Whereas before with Jenkins uh, that we were using um, to do these builds, we would see on average about 12 hours from start to finish for core and then all the uh, plugins and then you know those variants, et cetera. And with the um, migration over to the uh, GitLab runner CI pipeline and uh, really the uh, some of the vertical scaling that we've done uh, in lieu of moving over to uh, the Kubernetes cluster and the horizontal auto scaling um, mm. and then also with the uh, the cluster auto scaler that we have in the builds cluster 
uh, we've been able to take that uh, build time from about, you know, like I said, on about 12 hours or so uh, to under an hour. And, uh, and it's, it's, it's one thing to say, it's another thing to see it. Uh, it's actually really uh, exciting because it goes, it really, it, it takes the cluster from about six worker nodes or so to a, a little over a hundred uh, in the wow. span of a couple of minutes. And then it also um, ends up kicking off a little over a hundred jobs uh, concurrently. And so you can think of, okay, so that's, that's all well and good. How do you handle like the second and third order effects of something like that, right? So you can kick off 100 jobs, but if your supporting services aren't able to handle that kind of bursty traffic, right. so for example, you've got 100 jobs. Now you need to pull, you know, 100 images, uh, depending on your, you know, your image, your so image you policy and things of that nature, right? But yeah, yeah, so it's like, how do you how do you kind of handle that without totally tanking your service, right? <laughs> right. Um, so there was a little bit of uh, kernel and network. Uh, configuration that needed to happen there uh, that we did. We also, like I said, we vertically, vertically scaled not only um, the reverse proxies, but also the services themselves. And um, in, our, in our load testing that we did, uh, we were seeing a um, complete saturation of that 10 gigabit ethernet connection uh, for several minutes while the, uh, I would say like the bulk of the download, which is really the image uh, polls was mm. happening. So, um, so in that, that period of a couple of minutes, you're pulling about 200 gigabytes worth of data to yeah. this cluster that just auto scaled up past hundred worker nodes. And this is all happening within a couple of minutes, uh, to support that kind of delivery, uh, time. So it's, it's been really exciting, uh, to kind of see that, that progression and, um, and really, you know, uh, all of this is kind of born out of necessity uh, is the point that I want to make. Like it's, it is fun to develop this and work on it and see it improve and, iterate on it and continue to see it grow. But a lot of it has to do with just the sheer amount of growth and scale that we need to be at in order to continue to support um, Tech Product Center and uh, and its products. So. And it's, it's, it's pretty amazing numbers, right? Because in, in DoD, you don't hear that kind of number. You know, I, I remember talking to a team that was so excited spending, spending 100 million a year building a, a web app used by by you know 3000 people and and during the afghanistan uh exit you know they had to scale to 6500 which is not that much mm -hmm. you know use your core web app. um mm -hmm. in fact it's already a running error for commercial companies right and and right. and uh, they were proud of themselves to be able to do that uh, after mm -hmm. taking the app down for 5 days and I'm like, guys, you live in a parallel universe. You know, this is not how you can be happy. Like, this is not, you know, you you you're putting a hundred mil of taxpayer money, and you you don't have the the logistic and and architecture, right? Like you were talking about the auto scatter with Kubernetes. That's really, I don't know. If, I don't think it's just a Jenkins versus GitLab difference. I think the real, mm -hmm. uh, probably big different trader there was the auto scaling capability. I'm sure there's oh, yes. some progress in the runners, but uh, you mm -hmm. know, Jenkins. They can scale pretty big too, but uh, right. I'm a big fan of GitLab, you know. But but the fact is, I think the the scaling uh, capability was, you know, the real uh, differentiator there, and you know that that tells mm -hmm. you like the foundation. You know, people dismissed it. In fact, that team refused at the time to move to Kubernetes. They were using mm -hmm. Cloud Foundry, and they had no capability mm -hmm. to do that kind of stuff. And you know, the, the worst is they use it as a case study to show that they were successful. You know, mm -hmm. uh, effectively saying, well, you know. Five days during the Afghanistan exit, where we lose access to the app effectively for five days, uh, is a success. It's, it's, it's not a success. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just what it is. Uh, but you know, pe people, it's just interesting, right? Uh, what I find is uh, people don't know what they don't know. So unfortunately, when they've been uh, living in this DoD bubble for so many years and seeing what other uh, I've been doing, you know, often with wasting uh, billions of taxpayer money and and no ability to scale and, and you know, certainly not in a five day time frame. It, for them, it's a success story, you know, w which is okay. But but the fact is, you know, there is also a higher <laughs> bar of uh, SLAs, you know, back, uh, uh, I did a video on, on the service level objectives and uh, indicators and, and uh, uh, service mm -hmm. level agreements. Most government teams mm -hmm. uh, providing services don't have SLAs, they don't, they don't even know what it is. Um, mm -hmm. So it's interesting, right? How you architected the stack. So you talked about the cloud. You talked about the the foundational aspect of the CI. And so effectively, you're giving access to all these development teams to also build their plugins there. So it's not just your teams. It's uh, 
yeah. thousands of developers using the the pipelines to build plugins. Um, Correct. What are and the we, other pieces when it comes to mobile, right? What's unique mm -hmm. to be able to build these mobile plugins that you had to mm -hmm. figure out on the on the GovCloud standpoint? Was there some services like is there you know iOS specific build capabilities, uh, or are you are you using the uh, commercial products, open source products? Are you using Amazon services? Do you know? I mean, it's really it's we i mean we use gradle uh throughout yeah uh yeah because all these all these plugins and the core application are written in java um yeah. and really from there you just uh you would get your android build tools uh and that can run right. on um you know x86 and i believe arm uh so i mean it's it's right. fairly straightforward as far as the compilation goes for what about the ios uh, side of the house i guess the that the same side. right so so with ios it's it's you know, as I mentioned, it doesn't leverage that builds cluster uh, simply because there right. hasn't been uh, a ton of um, Mac slash uh, Apple uh, specific um, development outside of uh, ITAC. Mm -hmm. um, and so it, what ends up happening there is we do have uh, GitLab runners uh, installed on those Mac hosts. And then those develop uh, those developer builds happen uh, on those hosts. Um, so yeah, it's it's I mean, it, when you look at when you look at the uh, the ULF for um, for Apple, I mean, it, they they explicitly require that you run it on their hardware. Uh, you can't uh, right. you, you can't do it outside of it. So that's that's what it is. What is <laughs> so how do you end up doing that? I guess what's the process to get that done? From just like a, if I were to take you through like a standard iTech build, or yeah, just you know, how do you end up getting these iOS? Plugins done is that does that leave the cloud and he goes to to a um, to a physical device to be able to build those or, or well is yeah it happening? It's, that's correct it's it's a Mac it's an actual uh, physical Apple and, it's right. it's a Mac Mini that's what I just, <laughs> that's what you're saying for people right. to know how this works because most people right. have no clue how to get this done in the in the government side so how do you end up managing these devices are they are they devices you end up running yourself in uh on premise um yes, and, yes is it, it is provided by the the ceos or is it just you provide uh to to yeah. to the people i guess how do you end up you know when when there's all these developers building stuff how do you end up you know bring it to your device to uh, to do that that work i guess um, I mean, as far I mean, from like a compilation standpoint, it really is a matter of just registering the runner uh, in GitLab, right. um, and then from there, if a uh, you know a Mac specific build needs to happen, then you can go and you can use the uh, I think it's it's either tagging or labels. I can't remember the the book. Oh, I see. So that's how you uses, know. That's I how see. you would go and you can you slate a particular job for the uh, that that hardware. So you, so, you you connect it effectively the hardware to the cloud, right? To be able to right. automate that. So mm -hmm. it's not a manual. Um, it's not you human doing that pull from the cloud and bring it. It's all completely end to end automated. Yeah, that's that's pretty unique. I don't know of that's any team. <laughs> yeah, I don't. I don't know if you know. You could almost. I don't know if you're promoting this. Uh, you know, to get more money, but uh, you know, so many things are struggling with mobile. You could. You could probably. You know sell this kind of build build as a service you know even for people now potentially using the tech sdk um, you know as uh, because i can tell you there's there's just no one in the department that's that's able to really streamline the the build process of mobile apps um web apps sure you know but uh not native apps mm -hmm. and so that, mm -hmm. that is a pretty unique it could, it could almost be um spun out or become a, a separate service with the tax yeah. payers of, you know, we're wasting a lot of money um, reinventing the wheel. Um, you know, right. there's a team at, at Air Force, uh, PO Bez, uh, which is, you know, the business side of the Air Force. And uh, they have dozens of mobile apps and uh, they've been uh, trying to, uh, you know, Bespin is the software factory, uh, Bespin. And uh, they, they would probably love to engage with you on uh, trying to understand how you do this. Um, they have their own stuff. And, you know, the, the issue, of course, is, you know, people love to, 
you know, build stuff in vacuums and reinvent the wheel. Um, often for, for, you know, reasons they were taught, you know, not to depend on, on others. Uh, and sometimes it's fine and sometimes it's not fine. But uh, mm. at the very least, I think, Having an engagement with PO Bez and, yeah. and Bez, but you guys uh, definitely could lead to some additional funding. You know, uh, for that's a great growth. idea. I, I know a couple of the guys there. I'll reach out. Yeah, yeah, because you know, I mean, it, it's just a unique offering, and I've yet to see someone streamline it the way you've done. You've done it. So, um, and I, I, that you know, what what what's frustrating me a little bit. I'm not gonna lie. Is kind of the 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 very little amount of money you're spending to do this. And I've seen other teams do something similar and not even as automated and yet, you know, uh, take 20 times the money, you know, so, uh, you know, definitely I'm all about saving, saving the taxpayer money. Right. So, mm -hmm. um, sure. right. so sure. you talk about the, the, the stack, right. Mm -hmm. Um, I guess, uh, you know, when you look at the challenges, you know, you, leveraging mm -hmm. Android, Obviously, the, the uh, you know the, the tech stack is not that bad, but but when it comes to accreditation, um, you know these obviously the stalls, and you talked about like all the the disclosure and the the release process in terms of legal aspect of uh, mm -hmm. releasing mm -hmm. that to the store. But uh, you also have a kind of a private store for non-public plugins mm -hmm. and stuff, like UI stuff. Do you do that? Yeah, it, it, it kind of diverges. Um, so like, you know, we host Play Store. Play Store was always meant to be no more than kind of a like a, a beta user case or, you know, kind of a canary channel. Um, mm -hmm. And it's proven to be a lot more useful than that. But it does also give us a lot of really good, accurate telemetry. You know, if we, if we have a crash, like we always, always, always want crash logs. So if you have a crash in ATAC, like send your logs to support attack.gov. Um, but, but like program offices will employ a variety of mobile device management solutions. Um, they'll employ um, enterprise play stores. So, you know, play stores that they can pay for and, and you know, kind of use to distribute their own product. Um, and then some people will just like downright sideload um, onto devices, you know, either through, you know, just straight up USB um, or kind of update. You know, ta so tax server actually has um an app update capability uh built into it uh it is not a mobile device manager uh but but it is a, a good substitute and you know in the event you don't have access to one um there, there are basically a lot of channels that people can use for endpoint management um it's really kind of left to the program office to decide one of the neat things that's been developed though is uh in the absence of a mobile device manager that's meant to load plug like headless plugins that manifest in the ATAC application, which is a pretty unique design pattern. Um, uh, our, our friends in the army have developed a government owned and unlimited rights uh, to the source code mobile device manager called Watchtower. Uh, and, and Watchtower is, um, is, is a pretty deep capability. Um, there, there's a lot under the hood, um, but it's the first mobile device manager that um, was designed specifically for the tech products. Um, and, and so we find some other uh, mobile content managers that, that, that have arisen as well. Um, but, uh, you know, that's really the first mobile device manager for tech specifically. And that, that's how, um, if you're familiar with the DARPA share program, uh, that was a, was a really transformational program that the DARPA Strategic Technology Office led, uh, they've enabled some pretty fine-grained information sharing capabilities uh, among conventional forces over mesh network radios, uh, but, it, but it's pretty heavily premised on this watchtower capability, which keeps the apps up to date, keeps them synced with whatever version, whatever plugin configuration they, uh, they want the soldiers to run with. Um, it's a great capability. Uh, it's not publicly released at this time, uh, but you know, certainly knowledge of it is. Um, and so we uh, we simply aim to make really good rock solid products available to downstream customers and however they choose to uh, distribute those products to their constituents, to their users, um, they're, they're free to do. Yeah, sorry, I, uh, my, my Chrome crashed. Uh, what happened? You know, that's the first time I, I saw know. Chrome, I guess. Yeah. You got to try Firefox. Canada <laughs> wants to, uh, to innovate, you know, so uh, they're trying to slow us down by crashing my Chrome. Uh, oh, that's man. the first time that happened. 
but anyway. <laughs> uh, all right, so let's talk about uh, a little bit, you know, also um, the accreditation challenges, right? Uh, love yep. for you to give us a little bit of a rundown on, um, you know, you talked about obviously you have to deal with all these program offices. So effectively, mm -hmm. you're not accrediting as a, as a service for everybody. They all have to do their own accreditation, but you also have to do your own stuff for mm -hmm. your own hosting. Um, mm -hmm. So how do you with all, mm -hmm. all that now, I guess? Yeah, so for, for our hosting, uh, we take a, a fairly simple approach. You know, we're, we don't process operational data. We're not connected to operational networks. Um, we exist merely as a, as a development and distribution capability. Um, and so we we exist uh, currently under uh, kind of living on top of the FedRAMP ATO for, for AWS GovCloud. Now, we acknowledge and we fully realize like we should live under an ATO. Uh, one of the ironies here is that ATAC, uh, the tech products in general really are, are so broadly used, um, we struggle to identify an authorizing official for, for TAC.gov. You know, if it's a program developing and shipping capability, it's it's easy um, for for that program to like identify their own authorizing official. They, they pretty much always have one. Um, but uh, it, it's it's kind of service specific how they how those folks are arranged and assigned to programs and configurations. But with TAC, it's it's so highly commoditized and diffused. Um, we we actually don't have a, a an assigned authorizing official um, for TAC.gov. We 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 would like to have one uh, because we we have what we think is a really compelling case for a continuous ATO that encompasses the development environment and. The, the client products as well. Um, now the client products and the configurations that are shipped through program offices, th those absolutely do have um, bespoke ATOs because as you load up, um, uh, you know, an Android device yeah, or, Android or, a, or a Windows or laptop, Windows laptop uh, or a server uh, with different server. plugins, the tech server can have plugins, web tech can have plugins, web tech can have plugins. You're going to have different configurations. You're going to have different configurations. Architectures are going to drip significantly version and plugins are employed. So, so downstream authorizing officials will will have their own kind of purview. So it's it's really kind of it's separate. Um, you know, we, we make the products available, program officers accredit what they want. There was a time uh, where, where there there was there was some fairly emphatic views across the services in general um, in the federal agencies where they said, I you know, authorizing officials would say, I will never accredit that Android device for use in the field. The user said they needed it to do their mission uh, and. Thankfully, you know, the user prevailed and, and the kind of the AO community came around. Um, and certainly there's been a lot of evolution to that affront uh, where where now there's, there's fairly robust practices in place for identifying, you know, mapping all the NIST 800.53 controls uh, into EMAS and an authorizing official saying, yes, I approve this configuration. SOCOM has even done something cool uh, with, with an all things TAC ATO. Uh, programs have adopted fairly um, you know, novel, but also reasonable approaches where they say uh, the authorizing official and, and their, you know, their, their SCA and SCAR and ISOs and ISM will say, hey, I'm going to accredit ATAC, WinTAC, and TAC server for version 4.x. And literally the ATO will say 4.x. So, you know, we're now on 4.7, 4.8 will we'll hit the streets um, in, in the mid to late November timeframe. And uh, in theory, that 4.8 will be covered under the same ATO as 4.7 because uh, fundamentally the architecture is not changing and fundamentally the culture that builds those products and makes them available um, is consistent and the tooling we have in place to make those products available is also consistent um, and, and meets a, a certain degree of, um, of inherent security. Um, but I think that's, that is one gap that we have in the tech community is uh, because tech doesn't belong to a program where that authorizing official would typically be mapped um we 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 really like just kind of live within the the fed ramp uh ato guidelines for aws GovCloud uh for the development side yeah that's interesting and i guess is my mic okay can you hear me well yeah yep. good now okay. yeah okay. 
because uh, there's, I don't know, there's so many issues with StreamYard recently. Uh, I don't know what's going on. We lost you on video for a second. My stuff crashed. Anyway. <laughs> um, all right. So what's interesting with what you describe is effectively that's a perfect use case for a continuous ATO. Um, yeah. I guess what side of DoD is your authorizing official from? Well, uh, we don't have one. Um, I, I think, you know, we, we were fairly closely linked with a number of authorizing officials. You know, we have like warm relationships. Um, with you the don't have one for your, own that... cloud, for your own cloud services and stuff? You don't need to go through someone for that? So the cloud services we purchased um, uh, through uh, one of our third party vendors, through one of our, our contractors, um, but but we purchased the the AWS GovCloud offering uh, that's in compliance with or that's covered under the, the FedRAMP uh, process. So um, do we have a dedicated authorizing official for tech.gov? Uh, no. Do we build all of our services within the confines of what's allowed under FedRAMP? Uh, was it Andrew FedRAMP moderate, I think? Uh, yes. Yeah. And then we, yeah, you're you know, kind of we cheating also... the system a little bit there. And it's probably why you have a .gov and not a .mail. Uh, yeah, but, well, uh, we have a know. .gov and not a .mil because because we have non-DoD federal agencies paying into it as well. Um, the the .gov namespace, the the actual uh, TLD and, and TAC.gov as a whole, um, was authorized by uh, Mr. DC, you know, by formal uh, memorandum. Um, but yeah, um, yeah we, we 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 kind of break the mold here, uh, Nick, and it's yeah. it's strange because we. We don't field to just DOD programs. We field to Department of State, Department of Justice, Department of the Treasury, <laughs> a lot of agencies, DHS. Uh, and so that's that's the true reason why we don't have a .mil. We have a .gov because we serve the whole of U.S. government. Interesting. Yeah, so that makes that's, the that's authorizing official game a little bit nebulous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It is. It is painful. Um, I mean, you could have done it with a dot mail, uh, even if the yeah. .gov has to use it. But uh, I think it's it's also the, I guess the the having a country state TO with an enterprise AO like uh, Roger Greenwell in the Air Force DISA, um, mm -hmm. that yeah. that could be the answer because then you, uh, although Roger has never done a single the country state TO ever, but but if you if you were to join us with the modern times. Um, then they could do a continuous ATO, and then you would we would be able to spread it across all the AOs instead of each of the PEOs having to do mm -hmm. their uh, uh, you know process, which it sounds to be like a, like a total nightmare every time there is a new group adopting the application, right? Yeah, yeah. I think the the ideal case that I envision is is a, a senior authorizing official, um, you know, in a central organization like DISA, um, granting an ongoing authorization to tac.gov uh, intent, you know, the, the full uh, the full domain, um, and then granting reciprocity to all of our TAC configuration steering board members who then have to credit their own products, because then that solves a major barrier, you know, a combination of ongoing authorization that a central organization DISA, CISA, whatever, some some organization in the U.S. government that can then reach across organizational lines, extend that reciprocity out to kind of spoke organizations. That's the ideal situation. The products themselves already have like, an, you know, kind of a client app, uh, server app. Um, interesting comments on reciprocity. Uh, maybe, maybe not, but um, we, we think like, there's a good model in place for the client apps. They they have um, authorized, uh, SOCOM has authorized reciprocity uh, out from SOCOM's uh, EMAS uh, package for the client apps. Um, couldn't tell you how how broadly that's used. Um, you know, every office tends to generate their own accreditation package uh, for for their specific service and constituency. But um, we we do see the need uh, for for a better model for for tech.gov and kind of the the development platform. Um, I think what that comes down to is that that's a project for us. Um, and, you know, open sourcing tax server, for example, was, you know, that was a project that was a heavy lift. Um, and we, we, we must take these things on funny Gerald. Uh, we must take these things on kind of in addition to like automating things, serving the community and um, where there are willing partners that, that like want to like, contribute labor to helping us solve these problems. Um, like, I think that's where we find a good match between our aims and what needs to be done. Um, 
I, I will tell you flat out, like um, we, we, we just, we don't have the capacity uh, to go to go run down uh, soup to nuts, continuous ATO, ongoing authorization. Um, but we're an agency, you know, to see the value intact, the the pr proliferation of it, uh, want to help us pursue that. Uh, I think we'd be all ears. Uh, we, we've got a lot of documentation already in place that supports the argumentation. We have a whole confluence um, set of pages already cut out actually for uh, continuous ATO research, in fact. Um, so we know we can get there. Um, it's just a matter of, of finding the labor that it takes to kind of get up over that hill and someone who wants to kind of be in it for the long haul, keep that ongoing authorization valid. Yeah, I would have told you to go see Danny Holtzman, but unfortunately the HQE was not <laughs> renewed. So we're going to lose the only AOs that's uh, ever signed the country's darn. ATO in DOD. So um, okay. that's, uh, that's the end of it. Um, both <laughs> the Cloud One, Platform One, Kessa Run, Mm. F35, F22s, mm. you know, GBSD, all these programs depend on them okay. for their country's ATOs, but uh, yeah, that's that's all point. gone. Uh, that's yeah. too bad. So uh, how do you feel like the mm. DoD is doing uh, with the uh, Defense Innovation Board and all these software harmonization factories, a lot of discussions, a lot of, uh, you know, publications. Mm. Uh, mm -hmm. Did you mm -hmm. feel like, you know, in your time, in the department, have you seen progress? And more importantly, in the last year, do you feel like there's a loss, maybe a loss of momentum, or is it still mm -hmm. pushing pretty strong? I know the bottom up is doing doing pretty well, but what about the top down? Yeah, uh, boy, uh, I love the question. I have a I have a lot of opinions, and I'm gonna I'm gonna try to channel them. Um, the the guidance itself um, is like it's beautiful. It's you know music to my ears. Like I'm I'm a I'm a software engineer through and through, um, and have kind of been like you know up against or you know wanting to push past a lot of these barriers to delivery. Uh, I think my whole career, honestly, it's it's not a long career at this point, but um, like like the uh, the the memos that we're seeing come out. Um, like from from Miss Hicks, for example, um, the the Defense Innovation Board guidance from several years ago. It, I've I've read that stuff cover to cover, um, and and try to treat it as ground truth. You know, kind of in the circles that I run in, uh, we try to reference these things a lot. You know, as we're as we're building out um, TAC.gov, as we're as we're improving the delivery channels, the distribution channels of our products, investing in automation, investing in cybersecurity, leveraging open source, like. The memos really resonate. Um, I like to think I have a, a pretty decent view across like the DoD software ecosystem, whether it's in this capacity, in, in my SOCOM civilian capacity, in my reserve capacity, um, having been in industry, the, DO, the defense industry for a bit. Um, there's a lot of momentum, but man, does it look different across the different services and customer bases. Um, I think the the key difference that's really still separating us from being a like a leading technology organization um, is is how we organize um, we we treat it services organizations still as something that must be hierarchical and inherently subordinate to kind of the the cultures that rise to lead like the services for example um, you know ship drivers on the navy side fighter pilots on the air force side uh infantry or army on on the army sides um and and then like the, the acquisitions arms of these services um are, are beholden to those visions which is, is a good thing like you, you would not want like an acquisition person leading the air force that would not make sense um but what we don't see yet is kind of a break from the top-down it services organization and we still see it services organized as stovepipes we see different organizations responsible under the same kind of commander uh level of the echelon organizes, okay, like you're going to buy the cloud, you're going to operate the cloud and you're going to buy the, you're going to buy and operate the software and data. You're going to do the coding as people like to say. And it's like, wait a second, like, like Google doesn't have a J6. You know what I mean? Um, like we, we don't really like organize for flow. And, and I think with a lot of, of the culture that we're steeped in, it's going to be a while before the DOD is organized as flow. So like, 
it comes down to organizations, I think like Tech Product Center and others like us to organize ourselves for flow. And that's, I think what we've tried to do since becoming an organization is like, okay, um, great. We're decoupled from like formal, like, you know, J rock or, or whatever level requirements, big DOD requirements. We're decoupled from, uh, the congressional funding cycles, um, and legacy PPB and E, uh, models. So, so now how can we like listen to users or, or their representatives and deliver capability, uh, as predictably, uh, and, and innovatively as we can. Um, I think we're like at the program level, at the program office level across DOD, where we've like, I think kind of dropped the ball is we still treat these budgets for like software um, or infrastructure or cloud or whatever, like as things to be managed. Um, not things to be like encouraged, built up, get things out of the, get obstacles out of the way. We see pockets of that, but in general, I think what my own personal observation has been is that where where money is dedicated for like a system, uh, whether that you know the system is like edge based, goes on an aircraft, whether that you know it's it's uh, cloud native, um, we treat we treat it as as a system um, that you know has to be managed as a program. Um, and I think one of the realizations we've had recently in SOCOM, now given my SOCOM hat is different from my tech product center hat, but one of the things we realized in, in SOCOM where some of the technology is not premised on tech at all uh, is that like, hey, just because our programs are organized as these, these big vertically bifurcated silos of funding and, and you, know, you know, ops driven requirements, uh, doesn't mean the technology has to be uh, leverage, you know, kind of architected or, or driven that way. Um, and that's a really easy thing for, for programs to overcome is, you know, it's a pretty easy sign off from the PM, like, hey, as long as I'm delivering features that make it to an end user somewhere that are, you know, kind of in line with my uh, capability needs statement or something else derived from like DOD 5000, DOD I 5000.87, the software acquisition pathway, as long as I'm delivering features, a lot of other stuff can be commoditized and shared among other programs. We in SOCOM are just kind of starting to like round the corner there and figure that out, which I think is really cool. Um, I'd be curious to know like if other DOD programs have kind of cracked the nut there as well. Like, okay, just because our big budgets come in as, as silos doesn't mean the technology has to be organized as silos. It means that like we engineers have to actually talk and figure out like modern services to implement like an API gateway and an event driven, um, you know, streaming platform, uh, things like these. I know like, uh, like feed one, data one um, have a lot of merit to them. And like, we're starting to, you know, so that's starting to rub off, rub off on us in, um, in SOCOM. Um, but, but then we end up with like service bifurcations you know, it's like, well, hey, it has to be soft, peculiar. It has to be special operations, peculiar in SOCOM. And so it's a combination of building something that is truly special operations, peculiar, that does need to be built for a special operations user. Um, and and just like technologists talking, you being empowered to solve problems together. Um, we've seen some really cool things come out of, of the recent guidance, um, but uh, it's really going to take like, some very high level people saying IT services organizations and the services and, and, and uh, agencies and, and, and factions of those services, like even if it's in the acquisitions world or the operations world, because we're still, you know, bifurcated that way, there's either acquisitions or operations uh, organized for flow. And you know what, guess what? I'm going to measure you and your performance report program manager on the Dora metrics. What happens if we don't measure PMs on cost schedule performance and cost schedule performance are just treated as table stakes? What happens if we just assume that the PM isn't going to overspend, that schedule is never going to be blown because it's capacity only and performance is already always going to be on track because like we're just operating to a backlog that's built around users. I think if we start measuring like PMs, like at the service executive, like service acquisition of executive level, we start measuring PMs that have IT components to them, whether it's software or, or data or cloud or whatever, just on the Dora metrics, boy, I think the changes would be transformational um, in the DOD because then you have PMs seeking to solve problems on the day-to-day -day and the strategic level within their programs of how do I knock down these barriers to delivery? How do I actually get up to a point where every week I can be shipping a new version of my software where it's not, you know, it's not about new features. It's about how, how quickly can I fix the software? Cause these systems that we field are 
enormously complex. And like, if I'm an F-16 pilot, do I want to be sitting on a, a, a discrepancy report, a, a DR from developmental test or operational test for two years? Uh, or would I like to see that one small thing fixed in a week? Um, I, that There's some complex problems behind that, but I know there are organizations in the Air Force um, in the acquisition world, in the sustainable world that like are getting at some of that stuff. And I think I, I choose to view that stuff in an exciting light because I am like inherently an optimist. Um, I think the guidance, the memos, the, um, the the policies that have come out have been beneficial, but I think we're still struggling to make that connection between um, between like top down rigid IT services organization and what's really beneficial, which is the pursuit of flow of, of value. I don't see that happening today. Yeah, I tried to to mandate the Dora metrics uh, with the uh, OSDANS, but they 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 said no. So uh, in the meantime, if people don't know what Dora uh, metrics are, of course I have a video on it because that's what <laughs> we do here, videos all yeah. day. <laughs> so check that one out. It's very uh, foundational, and uh, you know, like you said, tracking the right metrics and tracking the delivery and and the flow and you know, that's how we build software, right? And, and there's just no way to succeed without it. Um, yeah. We're almost out of time, but I, I had so many questions and we have some questions from the public. So I kind of tried to cover uh, this uh, question that's also good time back. And I'm going to bring it up on the screen. We have someone asking kind of a, yeah. kind of a related question, right? Because you have engagements yeah. with agencies outside of DoD, with DHS and even 5i. Um, but but people were, were even wondering, hey, you know, can we integrate, um, you know, tack into the modern fire and police, and you know that it could be useful, you know, the hurricane response and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. So tell us a little bit yeah. about how that something like this would would happen. Yeah, um, pretty much anytime there's a um, a large scale natural disaster these days, um, you'll you'll find tack playing some role. Sometimes that role is really small. Um, we're we're like we're content with that. We never seek to come in and like dominate an event or like foist our product on users. Our philosophy has always been like, we're confident enough in the product that we develop that if it's useful to people, like they're gonna use it. Um, now to, to the specific question about modern fire and police, there are some really cutting edge practices going on out West, especially um, some, some East, Midwest, South, North as well. Um, the wildland fire community has really uh, started taking a liking to, to tax. So, First of all, hit us up at support at tech.gov if you want to learn more about that. We'll connect you with some people who are actively integrating TAC into wildland fire, um, uh, kind of like more normal fire and rescue operations, and, and also police. Um, the I think the open source community in TAC is kind of on the verge of taking off. Taking off. So like ATAC is open source, the SDK is open source, TAC server and the TAC server SDK are open source. Um, and those are opening up some really cool possibilities for people to use like open API to rapidly integrate new uh, APIs or, or new event streams into TAC server then for connectivity uh, out to the TAC endpoints. Um, so I'd say to some extent, like it's already there, um, but just in pockets. Um, I think best we know, like there is no like one, um, you know, kind of computer aided dispatch system to rule them all. Maybe there is, but um, you know, the neat thing about tax server is that like, hey, plant a tax server, develop the plugin that integrates your computer aided dispatch if it has an open API or a REST API into tax server. And even if you're just gonna push out um, you know, a 911 first responder call on the map. Um, there's actually a 911 um, emergency alert thing that you can do in TAC. It's pretty cool. It's the alert tool. And if you put down um, a 911 on the app, it actually alerts everybody on your network and it, and it persists until you throw two switches to turn it off. Um, so we use the same thing in DOD for, you know, the same exact same tool for uh, if there's, um, you know, killed in action, God forbid, uh, on the X in, in the engagement zone, um, or whether, you know, somebody has a Kazabak that's needed. Um, there's a lot of um, potential for, for TAC, I think, in the first responder ecosystem. Um, I think there are some ways that we need to make it it's simpler and, and more intuitive um, out of, like literally no disrespect for like people using it, um, but just because there's a lot of stuff in TAC that doesn't need uh, to be exposed 
So uh, you see the tax syndicate, those are some of our good friends in the public safety uh, wildfire response community. Um, they're doing amazing things. Um, and I just encourage you to kind of reach out to them if um, public safety, wild and fire, um, any of that is, is kind of your jam. Um, there, there's some really good uh, stuff going on. Yeah, like, uh, like I said, uh, on YouTube, um, uh, good endpoints to kind of get hooked up with. And that, that demonstrate, you know, something for sure is that small group of people can really truly impact the behemoth that is the the DoD <laughs> at, at scale and, and even outside of DoD. And, and you know, uh, I think you've you've done that. And, and of course, Andrew, with the team, as I've demonstrated mm -hmm. that uh, this is achievable. You know, a lot of people argue it's not doable and they find excuses not to do it. You know, you guys uh, you guys did do it every day. And, and that's. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Um, last question for you, right? Yeah. Um, and then I always give you you two like the last words before we we let everybody go. But uh, if you um, if you had a, a magic wand, right? Mm -hmm. um, what kind of help slash resources do you wish you had more? Yeah. Um, well, a couple of them we've we've kind of maybe like glanced at, you know, one is, um, you know, we're a very effective organization as is, um, and, and we live within the budget that we have. Um, but I think we, I think the community is, you know, kind of at a magnitude now where, um, you know, DOD senior leadership should, should probably start looking at TAC as a strategic resource um, and, and probably funding it as such. You know, we, we have, um, eight to 10 developers that are developing these products with a little bit of help uh, from across the ecosystem. So if you look at our organizational chart, um, you won't find a set of like, you know, really nice balanced product teams. Um, you'll find a few developers and a few developers and a couple developers and a few developers. Um, and, and like, it's good. Like we're, we're lean. Uh, we're we're going to do what we need to ship product. Um, but I think we have a, a more ambitious vision for like tech could be so many things that, you know, not just client applications, but, but a truly cloud native uh, situational awareness platform from, from the squad level all the way up to the highest levels of the echelon, you know, the, the core, the air force, um, the fleet level. Uh, we've seen some endeavors to kind of go down that road, but you know, they're resourced by programs. They're not resourced like through a central organization like the tech product center that's responsible for maintaining an operational situational awareness and command and control capability. Um, so like that's, that's like one very straight, simple forward, uh, uh, straightforward, simple ask that we that we would put out is um, if you're listening and you're at those kind of senior decision maker levels of the DOD or some of these federal agencies, know that like your people or the people that you, know, you exist to support are using TAC in all likelihood. Um, and, and there's a, a tremendous return on investment um, to put a button on it. Like we're, we're resourced at $9.5 million uh, this year. Uh, that is not guaranteed for FY24, FY25, et cetera. Um, something probably outside the palm just to, you know, kind of uh, avoid the, the rigorous oversight um, and the overhead that comes with that. But something that, you know, really, you know, levels us up, um, you know, probably to three to four times where we're at right now. I think, you know, we look at, you know, 30 to 40 million is probably the range we need. We need TAC Product Center and the family of TAC products to be funded at to really adequately sustain it for some of the more complex operational scenarios that we're looking at in DOD and elsewhere. Um, and, and again, we, we also uh, reference the idea of an authorizing official. Uh, we'd love to kind of like home grow our own, empower our own people. We actually have a cybersecurity lead on our staff, a government civilian. Um, so I have a bit of a cybersecurity background myself. Um, my master's work was in that area, but um, I, I'm not in that day to day. What I'd like to do is is find uh, the way or a way to build that person up, to build to build him up, and and let him be an authorizing official for the tech community. Allow him to assume that risk of the development environment um, and make the the always on latest mindset a lot easier on downstream program offices. But if that needs to be someone outside the product center, we just need to know who that is. Um, whether that's you know someone accrediting 
tech.gov and, and all of our processes, which we know are secure, we know they're robust, um, but enabling reciprocity uh, outside Tech Product Center would be a boon. So yeah, the, the second thing would be a, a, an empowered authorizing official who's willing to go uh, to bat for an ongoing authorization for us. Um, and the, you know, maybe the third thing um, is uh, it's, it's always hard to get a mandate out um, but I think we see enough TAC usage right now across the DOD is, is that it could be worth looking at, um, you know, a memorandum um, that says, man, if, if you're trying to develop a new situational awareness product, um, you're probably barking up the wrong tree. Uh, and, and we see that in some pockets. We don't see that everywhere, but we do see that sometimes, um, you know, the new map engine or, or, you know, new, you know, dots on a map kind of tool. There, there have been a lot of shifts to using TAC as the baseline for that, um, and, and certainly we applaud that. But what we'd like to see is like say, um, hey, TAC is, the TAC products are free. The development is not obviously, but the TAC products are free. Um, they, they're backed by notionally, we're not there yet, but, but an ongoing authorization such that if you are going to deploy latest, in any configuration of plugins, like you can do that. You're, you're allowed, we encourage it. Um, and, and then we start looking at the paradigm where we've started to go kind of with um, our, our foreign military partners, where now we're starting to see like people show up the same exercises with the same tools, TAC, um, Android, Windows, tax server, whatever, um, the same plugins for like tactical data links or our mesh network radios or um, other capabilities. And, and they now actually have like a common frame of reference. Another thing to mention about uh, ATAC is it's not just modular open systems architecture in terms of technology, the language is actually MOSA. Uh, if you set the, the language on your Android device to one of 10 different languages, I forget exactly what they are, can tell you if you're interested. Um, ATAC will actually change its own language in the 4,000 strings that are in the Android RDAT string file uh, to match the language that's on your phone within a set of 10 pretty broadly used languages. Um, so it's partner interoperability on a level that we've just never seen before. Um, there's a lot of facets to our model that make that possible, but um, I think we truly are on the verge of, of uh, of something big with TAC and unified situational awareness, at least for the 06 level of the echelon and below, maybe elsewhere. Um, but you know, we kind of need to see that that substantially increased funding profile so that we're predictable. We can incentivize our vendors to hire. Right now, if we're, if we're all hand to mouth with with our funding every year, like that funding profile that I talked about. You know, on average once a month, but it's really not that. It's a few every few months like i can't incentivize vendors to hire long-term talent and develop that talent that is so critical uh to a long-term operation we've been able to do that inside the product center but we need to start seeing that uh kind of a a, a dod and federal agencies level um uh, you know a, a substantial resourcing predictable resourcing in the out years so that we can actually incentivize growth in tech and the development of people the retention of people um, yeah, um, more funding, ongoing authorization, uh, and, uh, and it just, you know, broad encouragement to use the tech products, not for our sake, like we're, we're not evaluated on numbers or, you know, we don't use number of users as a North Star metric. That's not what we're pursuing. We know how valuable battlefield situational awareness is seeing, seeing a blue dot on the map next to you. If you've not had that before, like it's truly magical. It takes a lot of work to get there. It takes a lot of configuration of your kit to get there sometimes. But when you get to that point, when you show up to the wildland fire event, you show up to the the engagement, you know, it's, if it's a kinetic engagement, you show up to the, the joint operations center, the joint, the, the jock, and you see dots moving on a map, not just plotted, but like dots moving that reflect people, that reflect drones, that reflect fixed wing aircraft, rotary wing, armored vehicles, and you see these formations actually come to life, um, it's magical. And we can help the DOD and, and all of our partner nations get there. We're doing our part to get there, but I think we need to see a lot more gas poured on the fire to, to see us truly realize a vision of joint and all domain situational awareness. Yeah, I think you you just did a great job at summarizing 
what what most teams will need, but certainly you you deserve it more than most uh, other teams with the the value you've been bringing to the table. And a lot of people on the on the chat and comments have been mentioning like the value um, that you guys have brought to life with such a little amount of money. So um, I wanted to thank you, of course, and thank Andrew. I'm going to bring you guys back on the screen here one second to uh, uh, to give your last uh, uh, comment. Before we do that, I wanted to remind everybody that uh, there won't be a show next Tuesday because I'm going to be in France. So um, I'm going to go see my family a little bit. So I'm going to be off next week, but I'll be back the week after. And we're going to have a great guest, uh, Gary uh, Bartlett. Gary Bollett is the uh, federal uh, CTO at uh, Illumio. So we're going to get to talk about uh, zero trust and uh, uh, we're going to debunk uh, the zero trust nonsense on the show. Uh, so that's going to be interesting. Um, and uh, that's going to be next uh, two weeks from now, uh, Tuesday uh, 25th at uh, 1 p.m. Eastern. Uh, now, over to Andrew to uh, to give us uh, the parting words, and then uh, over to Ryan. Very good. Yeah, I you know I th I've thoroughly enjoyed being on the show today. Um, for any parting words, I would say if any of the things that I've mentioned today uh, have interested you, um, and you're interested in getting a little more involved with the Tag Product Center, uh, please do reach out um, either via LinkedIn or the supportattack.gov uh, email address, and uh, and kind of you know, let's have that conversation. I'm really interested to hear from you. So, but yeah, Nick, thank you very much for, for uh, having me on. Yeah, Nick, this is, a, well, this is a great forum, Nick. Thanks so much for inviting us onto your platform here. Um, we, we've got really super pithy mission and vision statements. Our mission is to empower TAC users and our vision is TAC continuous delivery. Um, visions and missions, of course, evolve over time, but that's where we are right now. Um, get the tech products, use them, um, ch check them out and, and figure out like how or if they work for you. Again, we're never going to come in and foist um, a product on, on somebody who uh, doesn't have a utility for it. But whether it's the development platform and you're a developer or whether you're a, a downstream user, uh, program office fielding to users, um, the tech products are and always will be free. Um, make no bones about that. Um, it's our job to figure out how to make sure that people can continue leveraging them, scaling them, implementing them in, in new and novel ways. Um, but uh, we see TAC as um, persisting. Like this is this is a capability that's going to live on uh, for for quite some time. Um, and so this is a really good time to consider adopting it, whether that's um, in it's a raw configuration uh, or whether it's in a, you know, kind of a more um, exquisite variant, with the, the, the military flavors. Uh, so tech.gov, get an account. Anybody can get an account. Um, if you're a developer in the, in the DOD or U.S. government space, contractor or government, um, get in dev tools and, and come hang out with us in, in chat, chat.tech.gov. It's our Mattermost server. Um, look forward to uh, making connections with uh, as many of you as we can. Well, thanks, Andrew. Thanks, Ryan. It was uh, very interesting. We learned a lot. We, you also demonstrated that uh, a small group of people can get things done in the department. Uh, so I wanted to thank you and the team. Keep up the good work. Um, wanted to remind everybody, two weeks, uh, Tuesday, 25th, next episode, uh, 1 p.m. And uh, subscribe to in the nick of time the TV. And, of course, keep up the good fight and keep fighting so our kids have a fighting chance at winning against China 20 years from now. Stay safe, everybody. Thank you.